Laura Benanti is making things happen. In addition to releasing her self-titled album and filming both the Gossip Girl reboot and Younger, she's also transformed her popular Sunshine Songs hashtag into a full-fledged documentary on HBO Max. Hear why all these projects feel like self-care to Benanti, why Broadway is her true home, and more on this week's Show People. Hi, Laura. So good to see you. It's so good to see you too, Paul. And I appreciate the snowflakes. We could all use a little Christmas right this very minute. I'm actually in her like little school room, like makeshift school room. So That's adorable. Of course, you have a school room at home. We do. I mean, we have to. Well, let's start with your daughter. How does she process this last year? Does she have any clue what's happening in the big picture? Yeah, I mean, look, she's a very aware, she's going to be four in February, but she's like not a four-year-old. Right. Um, she's never wanted to be a baby. She's just a like a grown-up, like an angry grown-up because she's <laughs> technically a child, but she's furious about it. Um, and she really knows what's going on. You know, if we see somebody who's not wearing a mask, she's like, why aren't they wearing their mask? They're going to give somebody germs. Don't they care about people? Literally, like verbatim. Wow. Um but I was saying earlier, it's actually kind of disturbing because she's only f- almost four years old. So this has yeah. actually taken up quite a big portion of her conscious life. So now when we see movies, you know, that take place, obviously, you know, pre-pandemic, she'll be like, why sure. aren't they wearing masks? Um, right. She under she knows COVID-19. She call you know, she understands about the virus. It broke my heart when she she said to me one day, I'm scared of the world. Mm. I don't know who I can touch. I don't know who I can hug. I don't know who's sick and who's not sick. Um, It's been really traumatic for everyone. Um, And I think for kids who are already sort of processing what this world is, um, you know, I think of her almost like an alien. She's come to earth. She doesn't know our customs. And it's like my job to teach her about it. And what I've had to teach her this year is really challenging. You know, Mm. it's really traumatic for anyone and especially someone who's like forming a foundation you know these are really foundational times for for little kids so it's it's you know tricky what is the world going to be like next time i see you are we going to hug each other are we going to shake hands i'm kind of fascinated to see how the world changes even with a vaccine yeah i don't know i think that's part of what's been so frankly traumatizing for people is the not knowing is the forced mindfulness of just being totally in the now and in the present and saying today we don't hug today Mm. we don't shake hands today we see each other remotely from our own homes and no one really truly knows what tomorrow will bring and there's you know in this 24 7 news cycle where you know it's really everyone is spun up all the time in order to keep their ratings. Right. You know, conjecture has become the new breaking news, even though it's not news. It's just like, what's going to happen? Does anybody know, you know, (laughs) in this constant fight or flight that we're feeling. So who knows? I don't know. I'm really just dedicating myself to living like one single day at a time, (laughs) because if I start to get too much into the future, I spin myself up into a place where like, I just can't function. It's been really interesting watching how different people have reacted to the pandemic. Uh, A lot of people have been maybe thriving in this new world and other people just get sort of completely crushed by it. How, how are you doing? Um, You, from what I can tell, you're involved in a lot of great creative projects. You have a lot of beautiful family around you. Are you staying ahead of it? If not, you're doing a good job of making it look like you are on social media. No, I mean, something I I probably should do a better job of on social media is like presentation. I'm very much like what you see is what you get. I'm a very uh-huh. big proponent of being a real person on social media. Yeah. I think it can be so toxic to to not be the sort of highlight reel of people's lives, I think can lead to really unhealthy comparisons. And, you know, as I think we're seeing depression and anxiety, and I just don't want to contribute toward that. So I try to share the highs and the lows and everything in between. You know, look, I am 
the way I deal with stress is to be proactive. Yeah. So it's not even like, look at me, I'm amazing. Like if I weren't doing this, I would not be okay. So being of service is how I get by, you know? Um, yeah. So for me, like the beginning of the pandemic, Friday, March 13th, that was the first day that I, you know, gave that call to action for Sunshine Songs. Yeah. And since then, it's really been, it's been sort of beyond me. Mm. It's been like this thing that created itself. Um, and so I feel really honored that World of Wonder and that HBO Max, you know, saw the value in its intention and in these remarkable right. kids and that we've now created something that I feel so proud of that I think is going to bring a lot of hope to people during a really dark time. Um, that said, when I look from the outside, I do see it's like I put out this book with my friend Kate Mangiamelli that yeah. we'd written a long time ago, but it came out. And then my album has come out. Right. And then Homeschool Musical. I'm filming Younger and Gossip Girl. So I, I think for me, work and being of service through work is how I function. Mm -hmm. My husband calls me a pathological helper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do think in some ways, I don't know why I always open up to you, but I'm going to. Um, I think in some ways, like I need to chill out a little bit. Mm. You know, I think I can spin myself up into a place where it's like I'm doing so much that all of a sudden I'm just like not okay as a person. You know, mm. where all of a sudden I'm like exhausted and and feeling overwhelmed. And I think some of it is a distraction for my own self so that I'm not like, what is happening? Right. Um, that said, I really do want to put good into the world. With every single action that I take, I want to be putting good into the world. And I feel like for the most part, I have been able to do that. Um, but I'm also like a little bit tired. <laughs> you know, I'm a little yeah. tired. The documentary is fantastic. Congratulations. Thank uh, you. It's exciting to see that what started as a very pure social media post that came out of your own knowledge of what it's like to be a theater kid and, you know, to have your show canceled. And it's spun into this beautiful documentary. And now you're sort of telling the story of the pandemic through this handful of theater kids. So it must feel really good to sort of see what came of it. Yeah. And, you know, they're such a diverse group and they really, um, there was a lot of changes and growth for them during quarantine mm. um, that I'm excited for people to see. You know, it was really hard to choose to narrow down to seven kids. Mm. And we chose them not only for their talent, but for the stories they have to tell and the good that they are putting into the world. Um, and I'm really hopeful that people will watch it. You know, there's so much content out there right now. You know, it's really challenging to be like, look at us, look at us. Right. But I do, you know, it's 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 airing December 17th on HBO Max and then we'll be yep. streaming into perpetuity. And I hope that people do watch and watch with their families because, you know, this generation of kids, I find them to be really, really inspiring. You know, they are, and look, not all of them are. There's bad apples in, in, in every, you know, everywhere. But all seven of these kids and so many of their friends who I have met through the course of this time, they're so accepting of each other and willing to look at themselves and willing to listen and hear and understand what's meaningful to you. And the discussions they have are just so formidable and, and grown up. You know, mm. I marvel at at them. And I feel yeah. like their generation takes a lot of like flack. You know, I feel like people talk about like, oh, they're just on TikTok and they're just doing like makeup tutorials. And I just don't mm -hmm. think that that's true. I think that they're using the world of social media that quite frankly, we foisted upon them. They're using it for good. They're using it for social activism. They're using it to connect with each other. They're using it to get justice. And I'm just very moved by them. And at a time where I do think to our earlier point that it's getting harder and harder to feel like what's the world going to be when I watch these kids, I'm like, we're going to be okay. And it's because of them that we're going to be okay. I love that. 
And don't worry, everyone will be on HBO Max this Christmas to watch the Wonder Woman movie. So they'll find your documentary. Good, <laughs> good. I hope so. <laughs> and your album, we have to talk about your album. I love a sexy, jazzy musical moment. Um, Thank you. Totally what I love. Exactly what I want my favorite vocalist to create. So congratulations. It's fantastic. And I love the go slow video, sexy Laura moments. <laughs> Uh, but it's such a great collection of songs and it's a real storytelling musical journey and you were able to do some songs like by like Selena Gomez and the Jonas Brothers and mix it in with things like uh, What Are You Doing For The Rest Of Your Life, which is that fantastic Bergman song I love so much. It's just it's just a great, a great collection of, of songs and you got to do it with Sony. What was it like? What's it like to get to do something with such a great label? I was really thrilled. You know, this is, I've been in this business since I was 18. So, and I've never done a studio album. I have a live album. And of course I've been on, you know, original cast yeah. recordings, but like, I don't have a studio album right. in 23 years of being in this business. And part of it is because I have such an eclectic taste in music. And I just felt like, well, it's just going to be a weird hodgepodge. And then mm -hmm. I worked with Matt Pearson, who's the producer on it, and he brought on Gil Goldstein, who is just an icon, to arrange all of the um, all of the songs. And we ended up with almost a hundred years worth of music on one album, oh, and it cool. feels cohesive. It's it you know if some I, I, for me I feel like if someone had told me that the same person wrote all those songs, I'd believe them. Totally. And you know, and that is a testament to Gil Goldstein and his tremendous artistry and the artistry of the remarkable musicians I had the honor to work with. So I'm really proud of it. Um, you know, I feel like I'm it feels like self-care to me at this time where our ears are just constantly absorbing the tension of the times. I feel like mm. it's something you can like run a bath and listen to, or when we're allowed to have dinner parties again, you can put it on and, you know, just it'll, it's mellow and it's hopefully, um, you know, speaks to people's hearts. I was surprised to see an Instagram post you put up of you in a very sexy leotard moment and you wrote something like this is 41 and you said that people were giving you slack about the sexy photos associated with your album release uh and i'm over it what what's happening people are giving you a hard time it's weird i so i posted my album cover and I was really surprised by some people's reactions, which were like really negative and sort of hurtful and demeaning. And I was going through my Instagram and deleting them like, and uh -huh. that just felt really cowardly somehow. Mm. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna find the most provocative photo and I'm gonna post it. And if somebody has a problem with it, that says more about them than it does about me. I've dealt with like body image issues my entire life. Mm -hmm. And feeling like, you know, what am I? Am I smart? Am I sexy? Am I funny? What am I? And trying to quantify myself to make other people feel more comfortable with me. And I'm 41 years old and I'm, I'm tired of it, you know? Yeah. I am many things, most of them simultaneously. And... You know, I don't need everybody to think I'm beautiful. I don't need everybody to think I'm sexy, but I do want them to respect my right to present myself however I feel comfortable. And if you have a problem with that, then then don't follow me. But I think, you know, I think we're such an ageist society. Um, and it, we, you know, we sexualize young women at such a young age age the average yeah. age of a model is like 15 years old and and yet we're all just fine with that but then when like a 41 year old woman who's had a baby wants to post a picture of herself in a leotard people are like what you know <laughs> and it, it's it i just found it really bizarre so for me it was like it was a it was scary and that's why i did it you know, mm -hmm. it was scary for me to do, but also a statement of like, I don't want people making comments. Like, don't make, don't give me passive aggressive comments about I'm a mom right. now and I shouldn't be posting things like that. Like, get right. out of here. <laughs> right. Amen. So it seems like you've left the city, right? You're a Jersey girl. We all know this. Um, you're, you're famously a Jersey girl. Uh, I know. I mean, 
any paper mill rising star has just, you know <laughs> jersey on their on their name forever did you win the first rising star award yes i tied me and okay. a, another woman whose name i cannot remember and I'm, i feel so bad about that in this moment but we tied and we won the very first rising star award yes and now i'm back in the dirty jurors so you are you're back you were living in the city right yeah i lived in new york for 23 years you know yep. and i like very much consider myself a new yorker i was born there i moved back as soon as i could when i was 18 years old and you know when this pandemic hit for a variety of reasons um we just felt like we needed more space for our daughter. Sure. Um, you know, she is dealing with like some sensory processing issues mm. um, that make mm. being in the city really challenging for her. Actually, we went to an occupational therapist and she put it in such a beautiful way. She was like, if you think of Ella's mind as a bank and she wakes up every morning with $100 in the bank, it costs her $99 to take the subway to go to school. Wow. And that leaves wow. her a dollar for the wow. day. And I thought, no matter how much I love New York City, it is not worth my child having a dollar left for the entire day, you know? Um, so we made the challenging choice to move out of the city that I've loved my whole life. For me, it was the, it was the place that I dreamed of. It was my Emerald City, you know? Um, yeah. But for me, it's so much more important that Ella have peace and quiet and, you know, can spend her sort of formative and developmental years in a place where she feels safe. And school will be a lot easier to deal with. <laughs> yes, that's true. Once there is school. Right I now, need... it's just mommy and daddy school. So she knows a lot about like Rosemary Clooney <laughs> and, and, and soccer. <laughs> that's what she's learning. That, those are our expertises. Your daughter's a real character. We've talked about her before. Um, does your mom, when she looks at Ella, does she see you? Is she similar to what you were like as a little kid? Oh, yeah. My mom was like, karma is real. Because I <laughs> was like a challenging child. The thing I tell myself about Ella is the thing that makes her a challenging child is going to make her an unstoppable woman. You know, I think raising like a raising a star is not easy. And I, I, she really has that quality. She's just so bright and particular and knows how she wants things. Um, it's funny because the, the things about myself that I don't like, like my control freakness, mm -hmm. my, um, like there's just a lot of qualities about myself that I see in her that mm -hmm. I'm having to remind myself like, okay, well I can change that in me but I, it's not for me to impose my own life's journey onto her. You right. know, my job is to like clear her path so she can be herself and also to help her learn to um, aim her very formidable powers towards the good because mm. she is so strong that she could easily become a tornado. And uh, mm. I want to help her harness her powers for good. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you told mom and dad you wanted to perform? Oh, like before I had words. You know, I, I just, I always knew. And Ella is the same. I mean, literally before I got down here, we were both in Mrs. Claus outfits with a sheet hung up. And she was like, you go out there first. And then you open the curtain for me. And then I'm going to walk around you three times and then you hold still. Then I'm going to do my trick. Then you got to put me down. Then you got to go backstage. Like she is just, I mean, it's kind of insane to watch. She is so serious about it. Um, like last night I had to film myself for a few holiday benefits and uh -huh. I told her if she wanted to do it with me, she could. And she was like, my husband came into her room and she was like, daddy, not now I'm getting ready. And mommy and I are going to perform and I cannot be late. <laughs> Just like a grown woman. She's not even four. It's crazy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It would have been fantastic, but she did not appear in the bathroom with you for your performance of, I remember for the Sondheim birthday concert. She did, but that is not the video that I shared. There's a version with her as your co-star. Oh no. She sat in there the entire time. Oh, covering really? Covering her ears and then burst into tears and said, I don't like when you sing. It sounds like you're crying. 
Wow. But I remember that because my parents are singers and I remember yeah. hearing their voices and it was too evocative for me. It made me feel too many feelings and I would ask them to stop. So I have a lot of empathy for that. I understand what that is. I really do. So I grew up in Connecticut and I feel like my childhood, similar to you, I just wanted to get out the whole time and get to New York City and dream my dream. And then I did get to do a lot of things I dreamt of. And I feel like you've been able to have amazing success, especially on Broadway and uh, just amazing credits and accolades. And, you know, in the last year with theater being shut down, I feel like a lot of people have been reevaluating what drives them and what they want to do. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering where your head is at, especially now that you're, you know, back in New Jersey. Do you feel like you still have the drive? Do you feel like uh, you're ever sort of like on a hamster wheel a little bit in your career to just sort of the next thing, always going to the next thing? Where do you sort of land with all of that? I don't feel that way about theater. I, it's funny. Theater for me is such a peaceful mm. place. Mm. You know, I feel like because I was welcomed there so young, you know, at yeah. 18, and it really became my home. I definitely had some challenging years with Into the Woods and like breaking mm. my neck, that sort of pre-social media time where I feel like there was like, gossip about me that was quite hurtful mm -hmm. um that i that was challenging but like sort of like pre into the woods and then like nine was such an incredible experience mm -hmm. and then again like i had some difficult times in my personal life but then gypsy was so amazing i so i feel like for the most part so 20 of the 23 years, I have just felt embraced and loved and a part of a community of people that doesn't get into this job to become rich and famous. They do it because they love it and they do it right. to be of service to pe for people. They do it to be helpful and, and, and because, you know, so for me, I don't feel that way about theater. I just feel like I want to keep doing it because I love it. Mm. It is the one place in the world where I feel like, ah, okay, I know what I'm doing here. And I know you and I know you. It's like when Dorothy comes back from the <laughs> Emerald City and she's, in, and she's just in Kansas. Yeah. For me, Broadway is my Kansas, where I just feel like, and you were there and you were there. And so for me, it's not a matter of collecting awards or trophies or numbers. For me, it's like, I just wanna be with my friends. Mm. I just want to play. I want to be with my friends and I want to feel the warmth of the lights. I want to do something I know that I am good at. I want to be around audiences who appreciate what we're doing. Right. And I want to see the crew. I want to see my dresser and I want to see the hair people and I want to see the you know, the electricians and I want to see the McDonough's who've been there for 20 years. And, you know, I just miss it. I miss the family of it. That's beautiful. You know, I think about all of the amazing roles in your next 40 years. There's so much more that you could be doing. So I can't wait to see it all. Can I tell you what my dream would be? My Go dream ahead. 10 years is to do a little night music with my mom and my daughter. That wow. would be my dream. Because she'd be 13, I'll be 51, my mom will be 81. And that's the perfect age for those parts. I wow. really like wow. that. I would just love to do if she wants to do it. I don't want to push her toward it at all. So have rehearsals already started in New Jersey? <laughs> we should probably start now. <laughs> I mean, you may as well. What else are you doing? Backyard productions. <laughs> totally. It'll be perfect by the time it gets to Broadway. Honestly, we could do it at Paper Mill. Oh, sure. I'm and that's sure. that's really full circle. So you're filming things now, and I've heard from other actors that uh, it's very different on set these days. What's it been like to jump back into it? It's odd, you know? It's it's scary, frankly. I mean, yeah. I'm really grateful for the protocols that they're taking. There's so, you know, I'm tested every single day, and I'm not exaggerating because I'm on Gossip Girl and Younger, which let me just say I'm so grateful to be doing. I am acutely aware that most actors are not working right now. 
And so I have a tremendous amount of gratitude that I'm able to, to work, sure. you know, um, and I'm grateful to the productions for taking such good care of us during such a really scary time. Right. You know, every, it, it, everyone is in full PPE, you know, shields, masks, there's red zones and green zones and all sorts of zones and, you know, narrow the two shall meet and every, daily testing. And, you know, they're doing a really remarkable job so that we can bring some comfort to people, <laughs> you know, um, in fact, filming has just been made an, an essential working position in New York City. So even if other things shut down, as long as our numbers remain low, we'll keep going, which I'm grateful for. And also like, um, right. it is scary to be like, okay, now I'm gonna take my mask off and act in a room, mm -hmm. but everybody else is masked, shields, right. goggles, away you know it's they're really doing a really great job i love younger i've never watched gossip girl so the reboot will be all new to me but i'm gonna watch it for you i'm gonna watch it it's a really great diverse group of kids and the storylines yeah. because it's on hbo max are able to be like a little bit more adult it's definitely an edgier version than the original while of course maintaining what everybody loved about the original and josh saffron i just he's the showrunner what an incredible human being he is. Mm. He just, it's, it's um, really aspirational for me as a person who is like now starting to executive produce things and create things. He yeah. is a person that I look toward and think that's how I want to be. I want to be on set, being helpful, being kind, listening, being available. He's just, he's a really remarkable person. I love the producer side of you. And of course, this documentary came along because of Sunshine Songs, but you want to keep doing this, right? I know you've been writing a lot for years. Uh, so this is definitely a path you want to go down. Yeah, I've been creating my own content for a long time now, you know, in, in yeah. little small ways. And then, you know, I have um, like a television pilot um, actually at Tommy Kale's company that I'm working on. We've been working on that for a while. Um, and uh, a, a mood like a Christmas movie with Connie Britton's company. So I'm definitely yeah. getting more and more into creating content and producing things. Um, you know, which that. feels like a natural progression for a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> How's your husband? You guys just had your anniversary five years. He's the best human. Congratulations. Thank you. He's a remarkable person. You know, my, our daughter's not been sleeping through the night and waking up super early. He gets up with her every single time and in the morning and lets me sleep in so that I can do all of these things. And, you know, he's so loving. He's, he's such a loving, patient father and a loving, patient husband and takes so care of so many things in our life and wants me to be as big as I want to be. You know, he, he never needs for me to be small in order to feel like a man, you know, he's just, right. I'm just so in awe of him as a person. And we've grown so much together over the past, you know, seven years. And yeah. I'm just really grateful to be his wife and to be in partnership with him. Oh, that's sweet. I like that. I like that. <laughs> the truth. I, I love seeing you and I love, you know, I've known you for so long now, over 20 years. And it's so fun to see you, how you change over the years and how your life changes and how you change and to see the success come to you. But I'm wondering, how has the last year really changed you? Do you feel like there are some undeniable things um, that have changed because of all this COVID-19 craziness? Yes, I do feel that way. I think that it's crystallized for me what's important to me. Um, mm. I, I've been really trying to focus on being mindful and present where I am when I'm there. Um, I, you know, I am a fast thinking person and so I can get moving really fast too. And then I'm not really ever experiencing anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've been, I've been actively pursuing, you know, a mindful meditation practice now for like 10 years. Um, but I feel like this year I really started to try and put it 
to make it more applicable to my daily life beyond just the meditation itself mm -hmm. to really be where I am when I'm there. Um, the gratitude that I'm allowing myself to feel, I used to feel like gratitude was bragging mm. somehow mm. that being mm -hmm. grateful meant that I was like, thought I was right. better than other people. I don't know where that idea came from, but to really just know how lucky I am and to feel how lucky I am. And then to use that gratitude as a springboard to be of service to others. Um, I feel like that's something I've been doing for quite a long time or trying to, but it's really, I feel really grounded in it now. Um, and also frankly, just self care, you know, part of that for me is like, um, no longer like using any substances to be somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, um, to just be like, to so to be sober, frankly, to live a sober life, not just abstaining from alcohol and drugs, but, but to be sober, sober in my thinking and sober in my behavior. Um, and that's something that I have grappled with for 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. um, sure. and would have, and I think anyone would be shocked to hear me say that, you know, even people in my, in my very close interior personal life would be like, what? Cause I was right. never like out of control drinking. Right. Right. But I, but I know why I was drinking, even if it was one glass of wine, I wasn't doing it to like unwind at the end of the day and like, you know, leaving a sip of it. I was doing it cause I was like, I need to feel different. Mm. Um, and there's, the think that that mind that that like that disease of the mind frankly that leads you to need to feel differently is something that i'm really finally in this year really making a priority and really mm -hmm. focusing on um in a way that i hope you know taking it again just a day at a time that i will be able to do for myself and for my family um because while it might feel great to feel different for 20 minutes, I know the negative effect that it ultimately has on me and those around me. I actually had a similar journey with alcohol, um, which I haven't been drinking because I'm not in the social situations that I used to find myself in. You know, we're all reflecting and we're all sort of sitting with ourselves. I do feel like we've been sent to our rooms a bit to think yeah. about what we've done. <laughs> and, so you know, I think some people are doing that and, and I hope that more people are doing that than not. Yeah. Well, Laura, it was so good to catch up with you. you I too, hope you Paul. have an amazing holiday season Thank with you. your family. And I really hope that I get to sit in an overpriced nightclub sometime soon to see you sing those songs from your album live to me with me other too. people around me very soon because uh, me it's too. fantastic. I'm excited about everything you're doing. So thank you so much for making time. Of Good course. You. Thank you. You too.